Our heroes have retrieved the Sunstone at last. But where will they end up this month? Or should I say, when? Dandy Mike. Though your journey to Darkmoor Castle took you quite a while, on the back of the Wool Dasher Mizzle, and thanks to some deep magics, you make your way back to Waterdeep in just the time it takes you to be caught up on the latest gossip of the Fey Court. You land just outside the squeaky wheel, Pla and Snedrick, you hurry inside to contact your sister, and the Wool Dasher Mizzle turns back to his Fey form and says to you, Dave, Dave the Dragonborn, yeah. when Achoom the Grey Wizard turned me into a doll. I thought I was destined to remain in that form forever, but your kindness has freed me. Should you ever need my help, the Fey Court shall be at your side. <gasps> nice. I'm definitely going to need that help. Like, just based on how things go for me in this universe, I will need that help. No, I, I, I was putting it romantically, but I, I can't really <laughs> tell. No, no, but literally, I know this is like, oh, you know, we should hang out sometime, but like, we should hang out sometime for sure. No, this is not a let's swap Instagram situation. Did like, you I not want to? I wrote it down just now. Soon. No, I'm saying we won't need, we don't need to swap the amount of What's time yours? it's going to take. It's at uh -huh. the wool dasher mizzle, mizzle for the the number. The number, not the, the word. The word. Real, Eli, you're going to have to get this handle immediately. <laughs> Re R E E L 69. 69. Nice. Classic. Nice, Sweet. right? All right. And with that, he calmly steps sideways through space and is gone. I'm going to be really impressed if somebody already has Wool Dasher Mizzle for <laughs> underscore real misspelled. If fucking Allbirds has that and they're parked on it. <laughs> I'm so mad. Waste. Oh, God. You, you saw their response to the fan art, right? What? Oh, no, All, I haven't. Allbirds, oh, did they no. love yeah. it? Did they love it? They re-upped their ads on they our other shows. Yeah. And I was like, oh, would they like some fan art? And Tiffany, so sweet, over at Audio Boom, was like, what? <laughs> Why is there fan art of the shoes? So I sent her a couple of the pictures of Wool Dasher Mizzles people have made. And she was like, I'm not, I'm not forwarding this. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to forward I'm just, this. I'm supposed to send emails. I don't know what's happening. Wait, what was the, what was the fan art? People have drawn Wool Dasher Mizzle a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Why? Why did were they sexual? Is that why she didn't? No, there has not been any Wool Dasher <laughs> Mizzle erotica yet. Okay. Did it have? Wait, wait, wait. Did it have anything to do with sneakers at all? <laughs> no. no, no. Okay, that no. makes sense. Of course not. But hey, Morgan, here's the good news. Now that we've said that on the air, there is absolutely Wool Dasher <laughs> Mizzle erotica <laughs> headed to your inbox. So enjoy. Speak it into existence. You just made yep. it happen. Check the show notes Delightful. for Morgan's cell phone number. That's the secret. <laughs> Speak it into existence. Okay. <laughs> the following morning, after an extremely awkward transplaner trip where Snedrick becomes the first gnome to ever conduct the ritual of the sun, Blade gathers you all in the main room of the squeaky wheel to get caught up on your adventures. When you finish telling him the long and torrid story, he pauses for a beat and says, Tiamat, damn it. Well, that means that's where the last piece must be. And, and a dragon? Yeah, I, I should explain. The final piece of the wand, the fiend stone, is so powerful just on its own that your grandparents thought to put it into the possession of a fiend, almost as powerful as the Queen of Chaos herself. But now that we know she's teamed up with Tiamat, I think we got a pretty good clue of where it is. Or should I say, when? Now, I feel like you should say where. Where? Yeah, I, that makes more sense. Are we doing time travel? That's right. Your grandparents put one last safeguard around the fiend stone. To make sure it couldn't fall into the wrong hands, they broke it in half and sent it to two different times so that it would be literally impossible for the queen to retrieve it. Nice. This is not going to fuck up the plot at all. It's going to make so sense. So how are we going <laughs> to retrieve it if it's impossible for... Okay. 
Well, but but when you put something in a time, it's also there later, right? <laughs> Thank you. Couldn't we just go there now and it was still... Yep. Or to the time when they're both there. Yeah, because there's going to be an overlap. You guys never question consistency in this adventure. <laughs> it's going to make total and perfect sense. It's probably better I show you rather than tell you. So Blade leads you through the winding streets of Waterdeep until you reach the outskirts of the city. There... Overlooking a cliffside sits the most peculiar lighthouse you've ever seen. Instead of shining a light over the sea in a swinging circle the way the other lighthouses on the shore do, it points its beam steadily in one direction. Stranger still, on the other side, it seems to be emanating an equally powerful beam of darkness. Blade stands in front of you and says, There it is, the lighthouse of time. And nobody knows who built it or how long it's been there. Some say it's the source of time itself. But when your grandparents defeated the Queen of Chaos, they placed the Fiend Stone inside and sent one piece to the far past and one to the far future. If a person steps inside the Lighthouse of Time, their soul is flung back into the body of their ancestors or their younger selves, or it's sent forward into their future generations. It's why the Queen of Chaos can never reach it. She has no family, and she'll never have children. She's never been any younger, and she's never going to get any older. She simply is. But uh, my messengers tell me her legions are getting stronger by the day. And if we're going to stop her here in this time, you're going to need to go both back and forward in time to unite the Fiendstone and complete the wand. We just don't say this often enough, but Eli, okay, that's that's pretty fucking cool. That was, yeah. that's, pretty, that's pretty fucking sweet. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's, that's I'm fucking cool. psyched about this. <laughs> gonna find out if Dave had kids. That's gonna be weird. <laughs> <laughs> you walk up the narrow stair of the lighthouse of time until you reach its top, and there stands a flame like you've never seen before. It somehow flickers with both light and darkness. Blade says, I have no idea which direction it's going to send all of you in first. We can only hope that if you all enter at once, it'll send you all to the same time. I've done my best to prepare the past, but for obvious reasons, there's only so much I can do. So, good luck. You step into the flames, but you feel no heat. It is the feeling instead of waiting for the bell to ring at school. It's the feeling of realizing it's midnight already. It's the feeling of time itself. And then everything goes dark. When you open your eyes, everything feels different. You're still in the lighthouse, but you are very clearly not in your bodies anymore. The way you breathe, the way you see, everything about you is different. And it is very disconcerting, but it also feels powerful. In front of you stands a little boy. His dark hair and square features are vaguely familiar. And then he speaks and says, Um, are you guys future you or now you? What? Okay, I feel like we're in the past because he has an old timey voice, like a radio announcer or something. <laughs> I feel like he'd be old if we were in the future, right? I feel like it's that simplistic. Right. He's young and therefore this is the past. What's your name, little boy? I'm I'm Ween. Ween Vigil. Ween. Welcome to the past. Okay. Young Blade Vigil, or Ween as appears to be his real name, leads you back from the lighthouse of time to Waterdeep. Or at least where Waterdeep will someday be. Instead of the thriving metropolis you've all grown to know and love, Waterdeep as it stands now is no more than a few farms with a river running through them. There is, however, one feature you've never seen in Waterdeep. A giant stone keep sits at the top of a green pastured hill as you approach it. And Ween says, there it is. Uh, that's your guys' home base or your, your grandparents' home base, I guess. Uh, anyways, that's the moving keep. I don't know how your grandparents built it or why, but it's legendary. You rode it into battle against the Queen of Chaos's army, and, and now you travel the world, righting wrongs and helping people. I, I, we should probably take a look around inside. I think it'll probably help you see who you were or are. Sorry, this part's confusing for me. All right, so very quick before I decide how much to make fun of it, is Ween named after a patron? No. 
Okay, all right. So. I know everybody had a big old. I know, about but it. like there was like something that could have been cut out of the. You're just your just your track and mortgage. I think that's for patron Ween in memory of my son Ween. Love you forever, angel in heaven. Ooh. So, our grandparents were supposedly like good people, right? Mm-hmm. So, if we're in their bodies and we do like a bunch of bad shit, is that gonna like fuck up? The space-time continuum? Yeah. You're going to have to find out. Mm-hmm. So if we just go around being ourselves, like... <laughs> <it feels like. laughs> the closer you get, the more you can see what a marvel of technology and magic the Moving Keep is. Like the only other creation of this group that you've seen, the Colossus, the Moving Keep weaves magic and mechanical genius in ways you've never seen before. And thus, when you approach, as though it recognizes you, the massive wooden doors slide open before you and though you enter all at once you all find yourselves mysteriously alone and in darkness oh fuck hey everybody just Hopping in to thank you once again for listening to the show. We have so much fun making it. I know it's a short one this month, but that's how the episodes work. We got to get ready for the next arc. And man, we have such an exciting next arc in store for you. I want to do a, a quick thank you. I actually talk about it in the episode, but I want to do it right here in the middle as well. I want to thank Alex and Don Ford, Voice of Fantasy of Adventure, helping me out with some of the behind the scenes stuff that you're about to find out pretty soon. Their help was absolutely invaluable both to me and the players this next arc genuinely probably couldn't have happened without their help. So huge thanks to Alex and Don for making this possible. As you listen, I hope you're as excited about this next upcoming arc as I am. But hey, if you're longing for a little extra D&D minus in your life, why not head over to patreon.com forward slash D&D minus. That's all spelled out. You can give us as little as a dollar and you'll get access to our behind the scenes Dungeon Masters corners, the small game we played, Lasers and Feelings. Plus, if you give us a little bit more money, you get access to stuff like episode chunks. I don't know about you, but I love to binge my podcasts, especially my actual play podcasts. And so turning to the next episode and keeping my playlist straight, that can be a little bit irritating. So what I've done is for $5 and up members of our Patreon, I've actually taken a bunch of our arcs and I've put them into giant chonky MP3 files. So you can just listen to the whole thing. And of course, once the arc is over, you're going to get the whole season in one giant MP3 file that you can listen to all night and day while you fall asleep while you're in the car without having to touch any buttons and so those are there for our five dollar and up patrons and hey maybe that's uh, appealing to you if you can't give us money don't worry about it we completely understand why not give us a five star review wherever you get your podcasts on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts give us a five star review it puts us up in the ratings also helps new people find the show more people find the show the more we can do it and we are getting really really close to that two episodes a month goal i know y'all want it i want it the cast wants it we're all super duper excited so yet another reason to check it out all right thanks so much again for listening to the show and we will see you next month bye bridget you appear in your room first and strangely you kind of recognize it it reminds you of the chambers of papa the bare stone walls and floor the simple sleeping mat set by a low fire. But before you can get your bearing, a voice booms out from the room around you. Again, familiar, but strange. Long ago and very far away, (laughs) there was a pirate captain feared above all others on the sea. He robbed and he stole from the rich and powerful until he was rich and powerful himself. So rich and powerful he became that he brought his friends and family to a small frozen island in the middle of the sea, fit for naught but penguins. There on the beach, he challenged the god Valkyr to a test of might, demanding his protection. And mighty he was, so his boon was granted. Not just to his people, but for him and all his family, as long as Sea Crash stood in the sea. He was Brant Boulderstash. The Pirate King. 
I just want to be clear. A ghost voice just explained to Bridget who she is in the body of. Yeah. Historically. Nay, nay, yeah. I had no idea about all that. There is a weird flashback to your grandparents going, so we have to do exposition in our rooms of ourselves. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. All right. There's an exposition ghost. So it's like ye oldie ancestry dot com. Yeah, something. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Little tape player. <laughs> they hope you press play on. 1923 and me. <laughs> do I have all my stuff? Because like all my powers are like wrapped up in this wand. Does my, if I'm at my grandpa, my grandpa doesn't have my stuff, does he? Yeah, no, you don't have the wand anymore. God damn it. Oh, we lost our inventories in the lighthouse. Yeah, you lost your oh, inventories no. and your bo- you have brand new bodies. And spoiler alert, you have brand new character sheets. <gasps> oh. Ooh. Big thanks to Alex and Don Ford, who have spent the last month or so helping me make your grandparents. <laughs> oh, no. I <laughs> Fantastic. That's we... way more work Listen, than is necessary for this show. Don Ford, <laughs> we know where you work. <laughs> we not only made your character sheets they actually made you guides on how to use your characters so you oh, don't have wow. to like oh, that's relearn excellent. them yeah so that's you'll amazing. that's so much work oh my god i feel yeah. like my grandfather is going to be super problematic and don <laughs> <laughs> oh any more problematic than davis yeah somehow i would imagine worse that's just my guess <laughs> we'll get to al jolson dark more in a second god Dave. Damn don't it. ruin this <laughs> You got a tap dance. You know what we'll get to? We'll get to it when we get to it. I don't want to, I'm ruining the flow. About as well as you do. <laughs> Claw, despite the fact that you climbed no stairs, you find yourself in the highest tower of the moving keep. There... In what was at one point a bell tower, you stand in a giant nest made of pitch black wood. At its center, laid out carefully, precisely, are the tools that could belong to one person and one person only throughout history. There's a ring of invisibility, gloves of thievery, and of course, a supple wooden bow whose red handle could only be stained with blood. The Aarakocra are a mysterious race. How long they live, at what age they mature, and whether they come from the plane of air or merely inhabit it are all a mystery. But there is one Aarakocra whose story is known above all others, who they say stole a magic stone to build his people a home out of the hand of a god itself. You are Talon, the Sun Thief. Hmm. Snedrick, you feel as though you must have taken a wrong turn when you enter the moving keep because you appear to be back outside. But as you adjust to your surroundings, you realize that actually you are in an incredibly magical imitation of the darkest part of a forest. A magical moon shines down through the branches above you, lighting several still pools of water. But when you gaze into these pools, you don't see your reflection or even the reflection of your grandfather, you see beasts. Beasts of all shapes and sizes, giant and small, magical and non, even creatures that appear to be made out of magic itself. Am I manimal? Yeah, you're actually (laughs) manimal. That's a perfect, yeah, you are literally manimal. And while these beasts aren't you, they somehow also are. Because your grandfather wasn't just a gnome of the deep forest. He was the first gnome of the deep forest, the shapeshifter, poop muncher Ferndangle. I am. <laughs> what? <animal>. Wait, what? <laughs> Did you say poop muncher? Yeah. Poop muncher, muncher of poop. Poop muncher Ferndangle is Ferndangle, his name. the greatest. <laughs> it's a family name. Y'all don't, y'all wouldn't get it. It's a, it means, it, <laughs> it means rider of great stags. I've found the character sheets. Can we start looking at them and claim yeah, them? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and I'll, my God, I'll forward you guys the letters as well. Dave, you step inside and find yourself in a setting very similar to the one you were just sneaking around in just a few days ago. This is Darkmoor Castle, but not the relic of feudalism you grew up in the shadow of. No, 
This is the peak of the Darkmoor's power. When the Darkmoors represented not scrabbling lords, but wizards of such immense power that communities grew up wherever they settled for more than a few days. And here you stand in the body of your first of your name, Lord Draconis Darkmoor, who journeyed into the layers of hell themselves to shake the hands of a demon and secure his family's legacy forever. Nice. I know Satan. <laughs> you, you, well, that's how you make Gladys. Your grandpa made a deal with Gladys. Nice. This chamber you've entered is richly attired, but every surface is covered with books and tomes, scrolls of ancient magic, and there, above the mantelpiece, is perhaps your grandfather's most famous and deadly invention. The Thunderbus. A sleek, <laughs> black okay. weapon of terrible power that ejects not metal, but deadly magic that your grandfather infused it with. I have a gun of magic. You have a blunderbuss that shoots a magic. magic. I have a blunderbuss of magic that I'm going to shoot myself in the face with somehow by accident. Yep. <laughs> okay, I'm still excited. I don't care. I don't care. I'm using this. Can I use it right now? <laughs> uh, sure, yeah. Well, you're about to, but the only surface not covered by books and magic is a corner where a large pile of hay sits over a grate. There's a large bowl of water, and as you walk towards it, the thick tattooed chain on your forearm burns hellfire bright and a three-headed flaming dog three times the size of a horse leaps from a portal that forms in front of you. This giant beast kneels before you and says, Greetings, master. I am Cerebus Hellhound and I am yours to command. Nice. Does anything weird happen to me if you die but then come back to life? No. Nice. Qu question. <laughs> yeah. Question. Yeah. It does it have a curly tail? Nope. Just a normal Cerebus Hellhound. <laughs> God damn it. When you've all finished exploring your quarters and getting more or less used to the feeling of your new bodies, you meet with Blade. I mean, Ween. Back to the outside of the moving keep. He asks you guys... Eh, you settle in okay? You got a, a rough idea of who you are and what you can do? Uh, I just no, I somewhat. Even <laughs> scrolling through my spells yet. Man. I know. I, I have a magic I, gun. That's okay. <laughs> uh, because uh, if future me was telling the truth, you you all have some business to settle with a, a dragon god? Yeah. Well, you will. Or you did. Uh, n never mind. But before we do any of that, we actually got a problem. You see... Before future me popped back through time to tell your grandparents we needed their bodies, they were already here solving a problem for the people of Waterdeep. Uh, as you may have noticed, this place is mostly farmland, but the folks here were thinking, what with the river and the sea so close, someday this might be a city. And they're going to have a city. They needed a sewer. But once they started digging, they woke up something terrible and dark. Now, only a few people have seen it, have lived to tell the tale, but if their stories are true, this horrifying creature holds dominion over the power of the earth itself, and only your grandparents are going to be strong enough to defeat it. M motherfucker, I got 4D10 damage cantrips. <laughs> we knows we're not our grandparents, right? Yes, he does. How? Because he went back into his body okay. to tell your grandparents, and then... Your grandparents told him, I assume, when he left the body. That would have been 24 damage from a fucking cantrip. <laughs> Jesus, I'm badass. <laughs> Ween leads you to the mouth of a pit recently dug and even more recently abandoned. And saying your goodbyes and following his directions, you descend on your own down through a tunnel that you swear feels slightly familiar. You walk for what feels like an hour until at last the tunnel leads you to a large open cavern with what looks like a small hill of mud and earth at its center. However, the moment you step into this cavern, that hill starts to move and form. It takes on a body, arms, giant yellow eyes that peer out at you from its undulating giant mass, and it says... Hey there, stranger. <laughs> you ready to fucking die? <laughs> yeah, it's Gary. It's Gary.
The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.